way of thinking about it. You can sing, Oh Jesus, you have promised. Because he's promised. Now we're going to get into, fortunately I have a theologian here. I am not one, but Paul can keep me from going off the rails. Going to start with a tiny, tiny Hebrew lesson. Let's not freak out, just, just a Hebrew lesson. Turn in your Bibles to Daniel 8.14. You're a good Adventist group, and I can't imagine <coughs> that you've never heard this text before. What text is it? Daniel 8.14. Do you know that we're the only church that studies this in any depth at all? No other church basically knows what to do with this text. It is the landmark doctrine of our church. Sabbath did not come first. What, uh, what, what, what Daniel 8, verse 14. And he said to me, For 2300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. Does anybody else have a version that's different? What's yours? And he said unto me, unto thousand and three hundred days, and then shall, the, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Cleansed. Mine says properly restored. It's the uh, New American Standard. Anybody else have something different? Nobody has some, something different? <laughs> me too. <laughs> Sanctuary be cleansed. The Hebrew word there is, I guess, alliterated as sadak. Starts with a T, S A D A Q. And if you look it up, it means many things. One of them is to justify, one of them is to set right. And one of them is cleansed. And there are several others. If you go look at a lexicon, you'll see a bunch of them. And I learned from a fellow named Leslie Harding, because I listen to his tapes a lot, that if it is capable of being interpreted more than one way, take them all. With that in mind, turn to Leviticus 16.30. Because what we're looking at in the Elijah message and the Elijah experience is a lab demonstration of the Day of Atonement. So we need to look at what happened at the Day of Atonement. And our verse is Leviticus 16, verse 30. And God is describing the Day of Atonement in this chapter. We'll also get to the uh, the 23rd chapter. Let me get to the right spot here. For it is on this day that atonement shall be made for you to what? Cleanse you. Hmm. And you shall be clean from all your sins before the Lord. Are you making a connection here? <laughs> okay. Now we go to Elijah. Elijah's story is found in 1 Kings, and we'll look first at uh, chapter 18. It's kind of going to be a Bible study today. Chapter 18, 
chapter 18 and oh, we'll start with verse 18. Elijah has walked straight into the palace, past all the guards, and nobody stopped him. And he's standing in front of Ahab. Now Ahab was king of which kingdom? Northern kingdom. Very good. You get an A. And Carmel was not very far toward the coast from the northern kingdom. This happened, you know, the northern kingdom disintegrated first. So this happened by way of warning. And he says, you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord. You have followed the Baals. Now then, send and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel, together with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the Asherah. Isn't it interesting that he did not include these pagan prophets in Israel? He said it differently. Now what happens? Go down to verse 21, 1 Kings 18. And Elijah said to the, all the people, Elijah came near to all the people, all the people. He is performing a high priestly function here. Come near to me. Jesus said later, come unto me, mm -hmm. all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Our God is not on vacation. He's not on another planet. He is interested in us. But he won't force us to come near to him. He said, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? The literal translation of this is, how long will you limp on the two divided opinions? And he goes on to explain that, what he meant. If the Lord be God, follow him. If Baal, follow him. And you remember the test. It was the pagan priests were allowed to do their demonstration. It was so dramatic. If you read that, that's your homework, if you read that in Patriarchs and Prophets, it was... No, it's in Prophets and Kings. It, read the whole book. It's in there. But it was such a dramatic scene. Here is all Israel. And there are these pagan, satanic people screaming, dancing, cutting, is what the kids call it today. They were doing everything they knew to do. And the contrast was very, very dramatic. And 2 Kings 18.29, we've already read this one. It came to pass about when midday was past that they raved until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. If you were an Israelite, you would know exactly the significance of that, wouldn't you? What was the evening sacrifice? There was a morning sacrifice and an evening one. Anybody know the word for that? In English, we call it the daily. In Hebrew, it's the tamid. It was a sacrifice that was done entirely by the priest. Am I doing something wrong here? It's not turned on. It has a pretty little light. 
Am I not? Am I supposed to do something? No. Oh, okay. Is that better? Okay. The daily. It happened whether anybody showed up at the tent of meeting or not. Do you understand that? It was a continual sacrifice that covered the sins of the Israelites morning and evening. The priest did it. You did not have to show up, confess a specific sin. You didn't even have to participate it, in it. But it must have been comforting to an Israelite to know that that was happening on your behalf. Amen. That you had a high priest mm -hmm. who made sure that this whole process continued to happen. Now, the Day of Atonement was different. The Day of Atonement all were to come. So when Elijah said, bring all Israel to me, he really wasn't signaling to them this was the daily. All were expected to participate. What was the punishment if they didn't? They were cast out of the camp. So this was a really decision-making process that was being requested here. Then Elijah, verse 30, said to the, all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord. I tried to, to do some research on when this altar was built. Nobody knows. Probably in the time of the judges. But there's an important little thing at the end of verse 30. He repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. That is significant. It wasn't neglect. It was deliberate. A deliberate choice. There's an interesting little um, text, and I should have gotten that for you. Saul, when he was king, stopped by this altar on Carmel because they all knew it. It was an ancient, venerated altar. There was no temple to any pagan god built there. And he built a monument to himself near this altar. So we have a Baal and a God altar. And what was torn down? The God altar. He needed to repair that altar. Now, how many stones? You all know this. What did they represent? Elijah says they took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. When you get these stories, never, ever, let a little tidbit of information just be a little detail to set the scene. God put that there for an absolute reason. Genesis 32, 28, in the interest of time we won't go there, but remember when Jacob was fighting with the angel? Jacob was told by the angel, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Why was Jacob fighting with that angel? Well, he gives a hint. Genesis thirty-two twenty-six. I will not let you go 
unless you bless me. Wait a minute. Didn't he already have the blessing? That whole fiasco thing with the, the animal skins and the subterfuge and all of that, he did have the blessing, but he was still insecure about it. Why? Why? Yes, he'd worked for it and he still was insecure about it, wasn't he? Because he knew he didn't deserve it. He knew he got it by not entering into the sheep gate. Remember when Jesus said, he that tries to enter the sheepfold by any other gate but me won't be saved. This is, the whole Bible's connected, you know that, don't you? <laughs> this, this is why he's, he's connecting it. Jacob should have believed the promise given to his mother, Rebecca, when, remember she went and prayed to God and said, why are these two kids uh, struggling? Two nations are in your womb and who will serve who? The younger will serve the elder. Now that should have given Jacob peace. He should have said, don't know how God's going to work this out, but I choose to believe his promises. No, he had to do something else. Okay, but we need to go back to Carmel. In addition to rebuilding those stones, what else did Elijah do? We're still in 1 Kings 18. He arranged, he arranged the wood and he butchered the ox. And this is just for extra credit. Does anybody know one of the animal names of Jesus? He's the Lion of Judah. He's the Lamb of God. Lion, ox, lamb, eagle. And those were the first four tribes of Israel. Those were their standards. Judah was the lion. I forget who the ox was. Do you know? Sorry. But, and then the camp arranged themselves out from, and the temple was always the center. Now the stones had been set right, but there was one more thing to do. Now if you think back to Sadak, what's left? We have restored, we have set right, What's left? Okay. What did Elijah do? Four pitchers three times. That's Israel, isn't it? Each tribe was <coughs> baptized, as it were. And if you want to go with the imagery, In doing that, the stones were clothed with a watery garment woven in the loom of heaven without a thread of human devising. Amen. What does baptism mean to us? Very good. Death we are identifying with Christ's death on this altar. Because, as Pastor Paul explained in his last talk, 
what happened at the cross was that we in him died the second death and that is how we satisfied the requirement of the law without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin Amen. that in those of you who've heard um, pastor Sequera talk about this that is that answers a Muslim complaint that the gospel is unethical because we had a substitutionary death and you know that in the Bible there are a couple of texts where even God says the father or the son shall not pay for the sins of the father yeah Ezekiel 18 so that that is important to remember here that it was us and Israel had lost track they over the years with all these bales and all these sacrifices they had gotten the idea that there was no personal identification if you brought a sacrifice to Baal it was that you did it your heart had didn't have to be anywhere near this sacrifice you didn't have to identify with it you just had to pay for the animal and then you obligated God to do whatever you were asking him to do you made a contract you didn't do anything with your heart and God can't do anything with that Wagoner understood the symbolism of baptism it's not putting away the filth of the flesh not the outward cleansing but the purging of the soul conscience so when we throw around a term the Elijah message and everybody goes mm -hmm. um, quick give me a definition turn the hearts turn the hearts from where to the fathers right our Father, which art in heaven. <laughs> Elijah says it in his prayer. O God, the Lord, God, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that thou art God in Israel. Notice he's being very specific. And that I am thy servant, and I have done all these things at thy word. Answer me, O Lord. Answer me that this people may know that thou O Lord am God and thou hast turned their heart back again the day of atonement is always heart work just take a quick trip back to Leviticus 23 26 well 27 on exactly the tenth day of the seventh month is the day of atonement it shall be a holy convocation for you you shall humble your souls and present an offering by fire what's what's it mean by humble your souls humbles the probably best word here what did that mean the King James uses a, an old word called afflict search good word we say we're in the antitypical day of atonement what happened at the end of the day of atonement the sins of Israel which had been transferred into the veil figuratively into the most holy place were cleansed it was the only time that Israel stood corporately as one with God 
So if you go back to Elijah, he is performing this very work for these people as their high priest. Israel couldn't see. If we really believe that we are in the antitypical day of atonement and that there is a special work that needs to be done among God's people, what do we do with that? That's one of the most important things when I was starting to study the 1888 message some 20 years ago. I realized it took every single Adventist doctrine to put this together and it finally made sense out of the sanctuary message and that there needs to be a people who are so completely in tune with God at the very end of time that he can seal us. Maybe Paul can do that because Zechariah 12.10 is, you know, getting, getting real theological. Help me out here, Paul. And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. They will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. That's not what we want to do. We want to be able to stand there and say, Lo, this is our God. We recognize him and he recognizes us. One of the most... Um, I'll leave you with this one because I know it's getting late. The sacrifice of Christ happened on a cross, which was made of what? And there was wood on every altar, wasn't there? Now, when you think about what that altar means to us, one day I was reading the book of John, and on the theory that you never ignore detail. John 20. This is what Mary, Mary saw in the tomb. Peter and John were not given this image. And it's only recorded in John. Verse 6 of, of 20. Simon Peter therefore also came, following him, and that would have been John, he entered the tomb and he saw the linen wrappings lying there. The face cloth, which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. The other disciple he saw and believed. Now, verse 11. Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping, and so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. Now let your mind just be open to what this text says. She beheld two angels in white sitting one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus was laying. Where else in scripture do we have a surface where an angel is sitting at one end and another angel is sitting mercy seat. Mercy seat. <laughs> That's a mercy seat. He laid his body down I'm sorry. He laid his body down on that so I didn't have to. That's how you identify with that altar.
Thank you, Father. Oh my goodness. What you have done for us. What a difference the human race got from you. We were dead and you brought us alive. Thank you for what you did. In Jesus' name, amen.